Okay, welcome back to the third day of the short term course. So um, uh, we start with the first lecture. Now the first lecture was uh, was was supposed to be held on supported ionic liquid membranes, but the span is due to it is already covered from his go yesterday. So we will go with our uh, Lecture, which is ionic liquids as I think there is some echo. Yeah, I think now it's fine. Yes, so we will start on the thermal dehydrogenation of chemical hydrides using ionic liquids. So we will be starting right now. I'll be giving the first lecture. Okay. Uh, is it visible, everybody? Yes, it's visible. Okay, okay fine. So, uh, again, welcome back. So, today my title of the talk is Ionic Liquids and Deputative Solvents as Media for Thermal Dehydrogenation of Chemical Hydrides. So, this uh, introduction of our uh, institute in IIT Guwahati is already given in the previous day. So, let me not elaborate. So, let me go straight to the topic. So what I will do is I will uh, elaborate upon what is ammonia borane and its limitation and the advantage of ethylene diamine this borane. So this uh, ammonia borane and this are all together called as chemical hydrides. So chemical hydrides means uh, the, where you have re, which can release hydrogen on the application of temperature or on the application of heating either with catalyst or without catalyst. So in this particular talk, this particular way we are approaching is to without a catalyst or we are using ionic liquids itself as a catalyst as well as a solvent. So then uh, we are to select this particular uh, ionic liquid. Uh, how we do that? We do with the cosmosac modeling. It is a conductor like screening model, a segment activity coefficient. So what you have is here. We will see, but I'll not discuss this model in details, which is just to select the potential cational anion through these descriptors. Those from chemical engineering background, they will be very familiar with this definition in finite dilution activity coefficient. This can be found out from gas liquid chromatography. So it serves as a good quantitative ma manner in which we can screen out the solvents. So this can be predicted. This is nothing but the activity coefficient that in finite dilution means when the solute concentration is close to zero. Then we will see the experimentation of how we use ionic liquid as solvent to, to dehydrogenate these particular chemical hydrides and then characterize the residual products using ionic liquids as well as deputetic solvents. So now let us see what are the different methods of hydrogen release. It's very important. So these are the different uh, methods for hydrogen release. If you see, you have metal hydrides, chemical hydrides, carbon-based materials, metal organic hydrides. So metal hydrides, you know, you have a metal at metal present. So this requires a very high temperature. It's a chemical bonding is there. And uh, resorption temperature is very high. Rate is slow, but it has a high capacity. The amount of hydrogen storage in this particular storage device is pretty high. Then you have chemical hydrides, which is the current focus. We have this sodium, this chemical hydrides, lithium, then magnesium. Then this chemical hydrides means something which is related to uh, ammonia borane. This is what we are going to talk about. Uh, so ammonia borane or amine borane both means the same. It's also chemical, but the absorption temperature is high, not very high. Kinetics are moderate. It has also a very high capacity. Then you have the carbon-based materials, the nanotubes, activated carbons, then carbon-derived carbons. Then this, these are all physical-based but it is very low desorption temperature. Kinetics is fast and is reversible. While the metal organic hydrides are, suppose for example, metal organic framework, where a bonding is physical, desorption temperature is low, kinetics is fast and have a large surface area. So what is this ammonia borane? Uh, in this, what we have is from ammonia borane is uh, uh, these different uh, particular storage materials, starting materials, these are all together called ammonia borane. You can have polyamino borane. If it releases, it will release boron nitride and four moles of 
hydrogen gas. So it is by volume, it is by weight, it is 24.5 weight percent or uh, 0.20 hydrogen in kg per liter. Or you have amy aminoborins, you get this type of reaction, or you have cycloborazone or borazine or these compounds which are having different weight percentage of hydrogen and this is converted to volume percent uh, weight in terms of volume of the mixture. So you see these are various reactions which can occur when you have this ammonia, ammonia borane. The ammonia borane gets converted into these different parts and they will further release within this, within this reaction. So now this particular reaction what it does is uh, some of them are not good, they are known to poison the fuel cell. So we use some solvents which are polar media. Okay, so what they will do, they will stabilize the react reactive intermediate. So it will increase the extent and rate of hydrogen release as compared to released with a single component. Instead of solid state release, we are doing it in the presence of solvent. So here the solvent is used both as a catalyst as well as a, as a solvent. When the next question comes is which ionic liquid you need to choose because you have so many combinations. You must have seen that uh, the number of combination was discussed in limitless. So one way of choosing is. Uh, so yes, this I just now discussed why we use ionic liquids. It can dissolve both neutral and ionic species, so it can promote polar transition states. So this is the way it is released actually in hydrogen. You have this amine borane, uh, two molecules of amine borane, and you have this solvent as an ionic liquid. This is the cationic part, this is an ionic part. This is the what you call as the transition state where you form a diamino of diborane, DADB it's called. So this is what the rate determining step. And uh, you have this particular compound, BH4 ion, which is to be which is produced. Now this formation of DADB then proceeds further and releases hydrogen. So important is when you use solvent, it has a lower induction period and temperature for hydrogen. Release. That is the advantage. Otherwise, you have to go with very high temperature. These solvents are non-coordinating anions and they provide polar inert reaction medium for catalytic reactions. So this is a reaction. It is divided into four steps. The induction step, nucleation step, growth step, and then further you get various oligomers. The induction state is you disturb the dihydrogen bonding in the presence of solvent so that it forms dimer and then uh, you form a nucleation. For this nucleation, just now I explained, it forms a, you know, this transition state and this transition state is called diamino of diborane. Then the growth state where further molecules of amine borane gets attached, DADV plus amine borane and it releases hydrogen like that this particular ring gets formed. Now these rings get formed again and again after addition of different amino borane molecule and keeps on increasing in size. So these are called as oligomers. These are called the, or these are called as residual products. So these BH4 and this type of different bond structures, the way it is boron is bonded, whether it is sp2, sp3, like that, this can be found out using a if you do an in situ, let's say you pick up the samples at different intervals of time and you do an in situ NMR. No, the in situ NMR of boron, yeah. 11B, boron NMR. Then you'll see whether boron is in sp2 state or in sp3 state. From there, we can say that whether the reaction mechanism as proposed here is correct or not. We will see that later. So these are the amine boranes. These are the molar mass appearance density, the melting point and the amount of hydrogen which has. Another one is um, entity is the ethyl diamine amine borane. So it is white to off white. Um, this is melting point. Molecular weight is 10 percent. Even though it is 10 percent, still it is better because the um, temperature conditions for the release from this is much more easier as compared to this. Further, the limitations. If you use the earlier ammonia borane, that is a chemical hydride, some high temperature is required, and it also leads to formation of oligoamino borates and polyamino borates to insoluble polyborazide, which is significantly stable in mechanical, thermal, and chemical environment, which is not at all desirable. You have the advantages of EDAB, which are 
it releases with an impurity, it can release up to 1% of hydrogen with an impurity of ammonia as low as 0.026%. No byproducts, no volatile byproducts till this temperature. And there's a lower induction period. So it means if you want to heat that chemical hydride in the solvent, you keep on heating, then it will release lamine boring. But in the case of EDAV, it's less amount of time is required. So we do a screening of all the ionic liquids. So you know this Cosmo RS model is a model which actually is a priori based model where you place the um, particular compound. Here you have, I have shown a ionic liquid with a cation and anion when it is placed in a conductor. Conductor means it has infinite dielectric constant. So what it will do, it will screen the inherent charges, the solutes charges. While it screens, so, so the interface is formed on the molecule surface and this interface is then broken in a number of segments and each segment has a particular charge which are called as screening charges. So these screening charge are then plotted in the form of histograms which you see here and these histograms actually say what part of the particular molecule has how much of charge. So with this we can say whether this molecule the red part, so if you have a red part means if it is uh, negatively charged. It means, sorry, this is positively charged. So positive regions of the screening charge will come from the negative charge of the initial, of the actual molecule. So oxygen will have positive values and let's say in, and you have hydrogen either negative values. So that's what it goes about. So now this particular software is also available commercially. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is distributed by these Dassault systems now. So this they'll uh, they do this calculation, this solvation chemistry, and you get this very useful properties such as activity coefficient. And we are only interested in those activity coefficient for deriving the phase equilibria property. So what we do is that we took some cation and then we varied the anion. So these are anions, different anions, amino acetate, amino propate acetate, methyl carbonate, like that. So many anions we have tried out. So we saw that this dibutyl bisphate and methyl carbonate, these are very high. These acetate, in dicyanamide, these are very high. So we did not have, we were not able to, uh, did, we did, we tried out these two, but these are some issues with the thermolysis also we did not uh, take into account this particular. So it means that what is the amount, what is, how many frequencies means with different cations and a similar anion, what is the value? How much is the value? How much is the magnitude? So the magnitude for acetate is pretty high for most of the cations. So we chose acetate-based ionic liquids in our dehydrogenation experiment. So this is what the overall, this is, I will not discuss this this particular expression. What it does is it will predict the activity provision of a compound in a sol solution or that in the solvent. So this is the electrostatic energy, the Gibbs free energy of electrostatic of a compound in a solution of a minus of a compound in itself by plus this is due to the shape and size, the compound in the solution, okay? So this is shape and size, and this is the electrostatic contribution. You put together to this, and you get the activity coefficient. When you have this close to zero, you get the activity coefficient of infinite dilution. So we selected these two ionic liquids because we chose this acetate because we were not sure with this methyl carbonate or into its physical property. Same case with dibutyl phosphate. So this is the overall setup. What we have is we have a reactor setup, this area. You have the nitrogen trap. We have the circular pump. So what you have, you place the sample here in this with the ionic liquid, heat it up, then open this valve, let it pass through. So see these gases pass through and then it goes through the liquid nitrogen trap. In this liquid nitrogen trap, we insert liquid nitrogen from the top so that other than hydrogen, all other gases are allowed, are absorbed, or they are not allowed to pass further. So because hydrogen has a very, it cannot be condensed easily. So the hydrogen gets passed through here, and then we close these valves, and then it enters this circular pump apparatus. So liquid nitrogen gets here, and the valve is open, S3. Then what you do, once it enters, so you have a vacuum, the entire experiment is carried out in vacuum. So when you enter air through it, so there is a pressure difference. So what it will do, it will just press up this mercury. So while it presses up the mercury, this mercury enters this particular arrangement here. So it is called, this entire thing is called, this part is called a circular pump. So while it does, this entire mercury goes here and it pushes down, so you get pure hydrogen. 
This pure hydrogen we take out from here and check it in BC gas chromatography. After that, whatever solution, whatever a compound you have here, we check it through these analysis techniques, then NMR, the boron NMR, then HRMS, then thermocavitic NMR, and the FTIR. So you see what are the compounds. We will have oligomers of these starting materials. So we see for that. So this is the actual setup. That's not just now I found. This is the reactor. This is the liquid nitrogen trap. This is your circular pump apparatus. Here you have the, um, uh, the particular meter where you read out the hydrogen equivalents and convert them and check for its purity in gas chromatography. You can take out the samples at different extent of time and see what is the effect of the kinetic analysis, what is the effect of the starting solution. And here you are placing the mercury. The mercury in the air is passed through this particular, you open this, air will pass through, it will pick up the mercury and, and enter till that region where it can balance the hydrogen gas. So like that, we did this with these two ionic liquids and uh, we got these readings. So it's pretty high. So 3.96, 3.52, 3.15. So we didn't go further because we saw plateau. We stopped here. So let's say these are the cumulative release of equivalence of hydrogen. So we stopped here. So why we didn't go further this temperature? Because 120 is the melting point of this EDAB. So we stopped before the melting point. So you don't want to go ahead. And there's no point in going ahead. We don't have higher equivalence. So we check the thermal uh, gravitometric analysis. It's pretty high, 16.42 percent degree at only 140. While for EDAVA, the butyl group acetate, 72 percent. The remaining takes place at 250. While in the case of the ethyl group, lesser, uh, I mean, it's much more stable. Smaller, uh, you know, the smaller ionic liquid, the smaller cation is much more stable. Uh, only 6.37 ionic again, 16.42. So it is pretty stable. So these are, I mean, you can recommend these ionic liquids as a solvent cum media, solvent cum catalyst medium. So when you see uh, what it does is if you have the NMR before and prior. So you see, this is the example of this particular chemical hydride. So this, uh, you see these particular atoms will be showing up at different ends of this chemical shift. BH3 is in the A region. So you see the A region here somewhere. Uh, here is the A region, but here you also have the D region, which is the, the CHG of the anion. So like that, we identify where are the peaks. So the likely probability of hydrogen getting generated is from this BH3 groups. From the side chain groups is the likely probable generation of hydrogen equivalence. So once you fix all the peaks, after the reaction, again test for the starting compound, you see all these compounds now. So whatever you have, this uh, this. NH2, I'm sorry, I am just told it different. You see the NH2, NH2 is the one where it is actually released. So if you see that there is no absence of NH2. So it means that uh, your uh, starting material is intact. That is an ionic liquid. Whatever is disappearing is due to the NH2 peak, which is present in the chemical hydride. For the other ion also, same thing. After you do the reaction, but so the ionic liquid remains, the peaks of ionic liquid remains, but the peaks of only the absence of NH2 is detected. <clears throat> now, this is for NMR for carbon, this hydrogen. Now, we also did it for, uh, now, for 11, the boron NMR. In the boron NMR, see, <clears throat> if you see this structure, in the starting structure, you have, uh, see, while you do this, already you have this oligomers being made. Right. So once you have these oligomers being made, so you will have something like both sp2 and sp3 hydrogen bond. Uh, <coughs> before reaction, you will have both sp2 <coughs> as well as sp3 pH3 group. Now, once you go from here to here, so you see it is now will be bonded by a double bond. So sp sp2 only, so sp3 will be consumed. This BH3 and NH2 will be consumed in the reaction. So if it consumes that you will not see any sp 3 bh 2 group, exactly that is the result. You are not seeing any sp 3 bh 2 group after a certain instant of time. <clears throat> so you can say that the it is the mainly hydrogen is due to the <clears throat> consumption of the bh 3 group. So you see that this is also matching with this particular reaction mechanism as proposed by some previous author, Liardini, who also proposed a similar mechanism. So we say that the pathway which we predict is correct. 
Now, still we want to check by a HRMS thought. What is it? <coughs> High resolution mass spectroscopy means uh, what it will do is uh, it will try to <coughs> take out uh, the molecular weight of closely, uh, you know, the oligomers. So, those which have similar uh, chemical molecular structure but different weights. So, it will have the mass to charge ratio. So, you see this particular, if I want to have an analogy, one to one analogy with this particular reaction mechanism. Um, this particular molecular weight, if n is equal to 2, closely matches with the reaction mechanism proposed by Leard and Eitel. And the particular molecular weight 339 of this particular compound with n equal to 3 closely matches with this which n equal to 3. If you put n equal to 3, you get a similar result. So that's why we see that it is proposing a particular mechanism which is something like the one which is predicted in literature. So like that, we went on, we uh, did it with various ionic liquids, and this is for the need EDAB. Need EDAB means when you only do EDAB solid state, you just need, you are only able to get 2.14 equivalent. While you do it in the presence of polar medium, that's ionic liquid, you get a very higher equivalent, but 3.96 is pretty high uh, with the acetate-based ionic liquids. As compared to others, we have tried that. I told you this is one, this uh, methyl acid carbonate, just get high values of Infinitely coefficient, but due to some other issues, because it contains a lot of microscopic, so we have lower equivalent of hydrogen. So, like this, we also computed this through some uh, molecule, this kinetic analysis. We got the activation energies of that red determining step. So, you see that lesser the values of this activation energy, lower is the and initial and infinite relation activity coefficient. It means <clears throat> lesser the energy you require to cross from the reactant to product, higher will be the solubility. That's exactly it is the way it is. But you don't have a direct relation with the lateral hydrogen equivalent released. So that's why we cannot say a direct one-to-one -one analogy between the, uh, the predictions and with the amount of equivalence released. But we can say through this activation energy that it is di inverse directly proportional to the infinite dilution activity coefficient. So, uh, so that's what I, I have just read down. So now after amine borane, we got, so we saw these two, the ammonia borane, and we saw ethylene diamina bisborane. Huh? So now we saw that, uh, okay, fine, we are getting some hydrogen at pretty high temperature, 95, 105 degrees Celsius. Can we reduce this temperature? Can we have a, a particular chemical hydride which may be able to release hydrogen at a very low temperature. Is it possible? So we uh, just screened out some of the chemical hydride family and we found out that these are some good application or a good potential. Even though its hydrogen content is very less, but the lower induction time and the lower temperature actually outweighs the other uh, hydrogen things. So if you other hydrogen content, content, even though it is low, that's what we attempted to see. So it is same way we did uh, just the same structure, but here since uh, what we did is uh, we this is a it is a similar uh, what you have like uh, you have a gas flow you collect the uh, so here what we are doing we are collecting the equivalents from the way we did it earlier again we are condensing it liquid nitrogen is here same figure I've just drawn it in a different manner that's it. So now we did with this particular in ionic liquids. So this is the, the we choose this BMI HSO4. The reason for a hydrogen sulfate, these are all screened. I just now I um, mentioned that this particular ionic liquid is also screened from osmosac calculation. Because of this protic hydrogen, this protic hydrogen, because of the acidic media it provides, it will try to uh, stabilize the reactive intermediate in this DMAB. Uh, so that's why this HSO4 and based anions is very useful because it's a protic ionic liquid. So now we did these two. So this is before hydrogenation, after hydrogenation for both the ionic liquids. Now this is the way, what is the, how will you identify the intermediate and the proposed reaction mechanism? Okay. So now this is, if you see, uh, we have three steps, step zero, step one, step two. So in the step, in step I, if you see, 
In this case, this is the pure ionic liquid and the amine borate. So the ion acetate proposed dehydrogenation scheme, if you see that the first step is that the protic hydrogen, hydrogen will be extracted from DMAB. So this is a DMAB structure. It is extracted from DMAB. It will have strong affinity towards the oxygen atom of the HSO4 alliance. So uh, from, it can, it, from NMR also we found that this HSO4 anion will release the proton in the reaction environment and it will behave as a protic ionic liquid. So as the anion of this ionic liquid prefers to remain without the acceleration of H+, it eventually comes out of DMAB and evolves as hydrogen. This is what it is. So therefore, the electron-rich protic moiety will participate in the pi bond with the electron-deficient hydridic moiety. So it will create the CH3, 2, N, BH2. This is the product in step three. So which is the cause of this intramolecular hydrogen state. So this is the overall schematic is this. So you have, uh, if I just uh, remove the ionic liquid from here. So from here, we are releasing, from here to here, we are releasing one mole of hydrogen. So what we did, we found out, we did a time-dependent uh, boron NMR. So see, these are the starting, A1 is the starting material, okay, the starting material, because boron you don't have in the ionic liquid. So whatever boron signal for, it will be showing due to the chemical hydride only. So see, at a low temperature, T equal to zero, and uh, if I increase the time, nothing is released. You only have the starting compound. But as soon as you increase the temperature, even at T equal to 15 degrees Celsius, you see, you get the formation of C1 and B1. What is this B1? B1 is the intermediate. Just now I discussed, this is the intermediate. And you have C1, which is the, the product, which is here. This is the product here. So it means that uh, if you see, uh, you see a, in this particular ring, you see a quartet resonance. So it represents BH3. This is the BH3 part. The, the resonance is even though present after 90 minutes, even at this particular 90 minutes also, it is there. And it is also present for all three temperatures. So, the, but the intensity is decreasing with incremental temperature. This indicates that conversion of the starting material increases with temperature. So at zero degree Celsius, the chemical shift does not change. So it means it is fairly soluble in this particular ionic liquid. So at, uh, but, when you go at 15 to 25, this B1 peak, just now I told, it is an intermediate. It is assigned to the BH2 moiety, huh? BH2. So it will produce a BH2 signal. Therefore, it goes ahead and at after a C1 peak at 19 ppm, this is the 19 ppm, is assigned for the, you know, this is the B double bond N. This is one, B double bond N, okay. So BH2 is for the B1. And this BH2 double bond is for the final product. And this is for the starting material. So this way, if you do an in-situ uh, boron NMR, then you can see the how the particular reaction proceeds with temperature as well as with time. So you see, now you are, we are able to get hydrogen at such a low temperature. At 25 only, 25 degrees Celsius only, you are getting this temperature. So now if I want to the... Yeah, so I didn't mention how many equivalents. It's just 1.97 equivalents we are getting, very less as compared to EDAB. But looking at the advantages at the very low temperature, this is quite very useful. So now you see one, the previous one I discussed, the uh, intramolecular. Now let's see the intermolecular. Intermolecular means you add another uh, compound of this DMAB. Now you see how the reaction proceeds. It exactly proceeds in the same manner. So again, here, if you see, the first step is the dehydrogenation of the protic hydrogen from DMAB. Then uh, the HSO4 here again release the proton in the reaction, as I discussed. And finally, you have this uh, CH3NB2 uh, CH3 product here, CH2NBH product, which I discussed just now. Now, in the case of the... So in uh, after 90 minutes of dehydrogenation, if you see, if you go to step four, after 90 minutes of dehydrogenation, all the dimers are not converted to B double bond N moiety. It, so it will result in the presence of a resonance at, uh, if we see this resonance in the earlier spectra, the second hydrogen will also be released when the protic moiety of this dimer will release the H plus ion. 
and this H plus ion actually will attack the neighboring BH2 moiety to evolve the hydrogen. So these are given by steps four and five. Okay, this steps four and five, and find, uh, finding the electron-rich protic and electron-deficient hydrogen moieties of BMAB will form pi bond, which is observed as the double bond N moiety in the 11B spectrum is now undisclosed. So if I just take out all the ionic liquid structure, the overall reaction may be something like this. You have a starting material, you have another DMEB molecule, releases one mole of hydrogen, it becomes this, then again releases another hydrogen, then it finally reaches this molecule. This is the way you have the evolution of hydrogen. Now, this was all about ionic liquids. We also tested our particular dehydrogenation uh, uh, on solvents. And we tested some, I don't discuss what deep liquid solvent, which has been already covered by Professor Maruko. So you have different systems. Uh, we have took a hydrogen bond acceptor and a hydrogen bond donor. Hydrogen bond acceptor in all our systems is common, which is the BMI MeSO4. Why the sulfur atom is there? Just now, previously I mentioned, because it gives uh, acidic media, which is uh, pretty much stabilizes the, uh, the polar intermediate. And we add up another one, the hydrogen one donor. This is the we vary from ethylene glycol, imidazole, mixerol, methyl acetamide, urea. These are the mole ratios where we add, add them. And now again, we do the infinitization activity ocean. Since they are very small, we took a log of these values. And obviously, higher the values, so we selected those ions. So if you see, uh, in these two, these are pretty much dominating these two values. So this system two, system three, then we went ahead and did the thermal dehydrogenation. So we will discuss system five here first. So these are the structure of this. This is our hydrogen bond acceptor. This is we can call ionic liquid and then a donor. We use urea and this, in this case, we are using the urea and uh, the imidazole. So we discuss urea first. So this is for the pure ion, this is the NMR spectra, and this is for the DES with urea. And if you have a thermodynamic gravitometric analysis, it's pretty stable. So the black one, the DES with this, only if you have the ionic liquid, only ionic liquid is obviously very stable. But you, when you have a DES, it is stability is pretty high. It is almost close to 180, 170. So we see that even though it is not much stable of ionic liquid, but it is stable enough because EDAB's melting point is around 100. So you have a good uh, favorable environment. So we did the dehydrogenation experiments with this methane sulfonate based ionic liquid with urea as hydrogen on donor. So now you see it is not that high. It means you have this, but as compared to only ionic liquids, it is not that high. Uh, this ionic liquid is scoring, as I told you earlier, this is much higher as compared to the one which is DES. So DES, if you the blue colored are ones with only ionic liquid, while the DES, if you compare 105, it is lesser. So one advantage of however using this DES is viscosity. So this ionic liquid, we know pure state is highly viscous. So the and also we found the induction period to be lesser in the case of DES. So that is the advantage actually. So that's what we plotted here. You have 3.7 equivalent of this with ionic liquid. And it is uh, not, com although it is almost comparable, it's not much difference with the help of EDS and uh, with the help of only IL. But uh, obviously, if you consider with only IL, it is higher. And then we also then compared with both AB and EDAB. Earlier it was only EDAB and it was almost similar, 2.55 and 1.40. So uh, again, this we see that this BH3 and NH2 groups are only consumed. So this particular peak gets, I mean, it is just, it is before the reaction and after the reaction. So this particular peak is 5.31. So 5.31 uh, is the one from NH2, and this NH2 gets kept consumed. Because we cannot see the NH BH3, which is here, it is imbibed within this. So we can only see NH2. So NH2 is getting consumed within this region. So we can say that because of the consumption NH2, hydrogen is developed. Again, if you see AB is releasing a very lesser high equivalent as compared to EDAB. Now, that's what we propose a mechanism. Now, the mechanism we can check with a pure solid state EDAB because uh, 
instead of catalyst we saw only a solid state and we found out using the same steps as mentioned how it proceeds we just took out the solvent the particular um the solvent out and we did the calculation for only solid state chemical hydride so we told you that you have a dab monomer attached another dab monomer you heat it up you get the transition state dadb again in the second step this gets rearranged this bh4 to this particular step then this transition step goes to this step it forms the oligomers then oligomers cyclic compound the cyclic compound and finally gets attached so this can be represented using various transition state just now i showed transition state 1 and this is state 2 this is reactant 1 product 1 reactant 2 so it's a continuation of each other product 2 like that we have reactant 3 product 3 and finally reactant 4 product 4 so this is uh, the how it progress uh, you know how this particular uh, mechanism progresses with but uh, with in the gas space they yeah, are in the gas space of the uh, we did quantum chemical calculation and we found out the energy barriers between various steps for solid state eda so this is what we found out so this is what uh, the particular structure just i just now this is starting structure then the dimer then again reactant one product one then these are the various steps finally the product is formed product four is formed so you see we are here if we mark this as zero and final product just this so the overall change in energy you see uh, this edab dimer then it goes up like that so we measured this particular change in the relative energy barrier so we found that the relative energy barrier for ts2 is the highest so this is we call as the determining step and this ts2 is nothing but uh, this we have discussed earlier these are the probable mechanism but out this is what the dadb formation we all already discussed this diamino of diborane so that is the pathway we actually it is also formed from from the gas phase uh, pathway uh, gas phase reaction so i will stop here finally and uh, the concluding we saw the dehydration with amine borane the stabilization we saw how the polar intermediates are stabilized and we also confirmed using h1 and 11b nmr and we can confirm the molecular weight by hnms spectra this acetate based ionic liquid is gives the highest equivalent of hydrogen and we found a inverse relation between finite division activity coefficient and cost theory and uh, ionic liquids we also analytic we also saw ionic liquid based liquid with solvents for thermal dehydrogenation and then also we confirm this mechanism and we saw dimethyl of amino borane which gives a low induction time as well as low temperature hydrogen equivalence uh acknowledgments my uh, my colleague professor g pugazanti who helped me in the experimental setup the students till now who have been working in this project dhirendra dibashi tashiditi and suman and the funding agency and uh, thank you so i will be open for any question yes if there is any other any question you can ask well partho you can see if there is any question in the youtube maybe they'll put it in the chat box else okay let me okay. check that yes if just see sometimes because if i check the problem is the echo comes so Okay. Uh, right now, I am not uh, seeing any. Uh, actually, this okay. link. Okay. Okay. Fine. Fine. Okay. If you have any question, then you can ask later. Also, you can just mail me all the participants. Okay. Not an issue. I can. Uh, we can uh, respond through email. So, so I'll just stop here, and now we proceed to our uh, next lecture. Which is my, my colleague, Professor Parthasarthi Gupathida.
So he will be speaking on the fabrication of the microfluidic device and micro extraction techniques using deep eutectic solvents. Um, so Partho, you can please okay. start the lecture. Yeah. Okay. So uh, can you see these slides? Hello. Yes, I can see the slide. OK, fine. So uh, welcome to this uh, lecture and uh, uh, good evening to all the Indian participants and good afternoon to all these uh, uh, participants from Portugal and good morning to uh, participants from Rio de Janeiro. So uh, now this topic of this lecture is the fabrication of microfluidic device and uh, how we can use this microfluidic device to uh, extract uh, some of the pollutants or uh, some uh, basically we are using this uh, DES as one phase and uh, another phase maybe it's a pollu uh, polluted water or something we just extract this pollutant and all okay so but I, I'll not talk too much about this DES as you have already covered. Uh, uh, you have already learned how to select this uh, particular DES targeting to some molecules yeah. or something and uh, scavenge uh, this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but I think your YouTube is on. So that's why this. Uh, no, I have closed all this. OK, things. OK, please continue. Yes, yes, not an issue. Yeah, yeah, please continue. Yeah. So, uh, so I'll talk about mainly on this uh, microfluidic device and how to fabricate this. And uh, not only this microfluidic device, I'll also talk about this microfabrication. I mean, uh, this uh, microstructures, how you can prepare on a surface and how you can use it for different purposes, say for extraction I have already talked about, then uh, this sensing part and uh, sensing some molecules or solvents like that. So that uh, I am going to cover in this lecture. So uh, what is this microfluidics? It is basically a confined environment will be provided by this microfluidics and it operates in a very small scale. OK, now this small scale is relative. It can be going from this uh, nano scale to uh, micro then uh, sub millimeter uh, range. It can vary. OK, so maybe it's a 500 micrometer channel or 800 micrometer channel. Also, we can call it as a micro channel or it can be used as a microfluidic device. OK, so here I'm uh, showing some examples. Uh, uh, maybe just. You can see that there are uh, three different uh, liquid droplets this one, this one and this one, and uh, this can be operated I mean, this video is not running. Maybe I can just. OK, you see this. These three micro droplets can meet at some position. OK, and they can be driven on a surface to a particular direction. This is an open channel. OK, so you can think of some. Uh, this is a uh, micro reactor and it is passing through different temperature regime so that it can uh, do some reactions on a microfluidic chip. OK, so this is a microfluidic example of a microfluidic reaction reactor. So similarly, you can see here a condenser or micro condenser or micro heat exchanger. You know this uh, when this condensed uh, film is uh, uh, formed, it offers more, much more resistance to heat exchange, right? So we need that this uh, fluid, whatever is forming this film, it needs to be go away immediately so that it can offer very less resistance to heat transfer and it can uh, condense in a much efficient manner. So here you can see that this condensation is taking place and these droplets are going away from this center away from this surface. So some uh, surface modification is done on this so that, that this droplet cannot sit and form a film. OK, so this is one example of this uh, uh, microfluidics, uh, uh, how it can be used as a efficient heat exchanger or microfluidic reactor. OK, 
So here you can uh, uh, here I have shown one example of this uh, schematics of this microfluidic extraction, micro extraction, where one phase you can use as a DES phase, deprotectic solvent, to scavenge some pollutant from a contaminated water. Okay, so here this two phases pass through this uh, microfluidic channel. Okay, and they will mix. And uh, this contaminants from this uh, water, it can be scavenged by this either DS phase itself or some uh, scavenger you can incorporate in this DS phase that can scavenge the uh, pollutant and it can be taken out. Yeah. Later on, you can detect that uh, from this color change or any other uh, method uh, how this. Uh, how efficient is that? I mean, how you can uh, this water is becoming contaminated free. OK, now you know this this microfluidic channel. As it is a very uh, small diameter, its Reynolds number is very small. OK, so it is very difficult to mix uh, to immiscible liquid or anything within this microfluidic channel. OK, so for that, sometimes we use some external stimuli. It can be magnetic field or it can be electric field or some any other uh, field which can generate some turbulence within this uh, microfluidic channel. It can mix this uh, two uh, immiscible phase and it can be extracted. So here I have uh, shown one example. I mean, uh, this uh, work is done by one of my uh, students. So you see this first one here we have used uniform electric field and two immiscible uh, layers. One is uh, blue layers, one is red layers. So they are mixing. OK, and same same uh, thing we have shown here in this uh, below panel. Here we are showing this concentration of some material uh, in uh, when it is red colored, it is 100 uh, percent. When it is blue, it is zero. So you can see that if I play it from beginning again you see initially this concentration of this particular component it is in this uh, central phase i mean the liquid in this uh, central phase and this annular phase it contains no molecules no the target molecules so when we apply this electric field this mixing happens this is that volume fraction we have shown and here we have shown this concentration of that molecule you see it is covering the whole, whole area. It is coming like here, this blue region. And here in this next panel, if you see that here we have used non-uniform electric field and we have shown this efficiency of this non-uniform electric field, which is much, much higher than this uniform electric field. So these are the example of, you see this uh, more turbulence is created. And here you will see this. Mixing is much more prominent here. OK, so here we have uh, shown this uh, how this external electric field affects the mixing. OK, uh, so for talk about this microfabrication before going into that, uh, it will be good to talk about lithography. You I think you all of uh, you heard about this term lithography. Lithography, uh, this litho means stone. And graphing means to write. OK, so initially, I mean, when it was invented, it was invented by Alois Senefelder. Uh, he was an artist, theoretical artist. So what he did that uh, he has to write something and he has to distribute it to all these musicians and all. And he, uh, that uh, during that time, it was written by hand. OK, so same thing he was doing this repeating thing again and again. So to avoid that, he invented this lithography technique. So what is it? He uh, took some uh, stone, limestone. OK, and uh, he first uh, cleaned this limestone. Then he painted on this limestone. OK, and this painting was done with some uh, greasy ink. OK, and the principle of this lithography, it lies that water doesn't like oil or grease and grease or oil doesn't like water. OK, so ink is mainly this 
grease based or oil based so he writes on this uh, limestone then what he does that this limestone is then uh, processed process means there is some gum arabic which is water soluble gum uh, he painted on that so those area just where there is no ink grease based ink it accumulates there and this uh, where there is grease based ink it repels from there because it is water based right so then this is repeatedly washing was done and on top of it this rolling with this ink that grease based ink was done repeatedly okay so that this ink become prominent on this on that particular point where this initial uh, painting was done okay then uh, again this uh, washing and uh, rolling with this ink was done repeatedly and lastly you can just get this uh, paper a blank paper you just take press it on that ink on that uh, on that uh, limestone and you get this imprint so then it, you can do it several times you just roll it with this ink and you can just press this uh, white paper and it is printed this uh, it is basically just uh, print transfer kind of thing so he invented this uh, in 1796 after that this technique this lithography technique is adopted to do very minute uh, photolithography uh, many uh, uh, microelectromechanical systems are fabricated or nano electromechanical systems names are fabricated there is one limitation of this photolithography that is that optical diffraction limit i mean whatever this light you are going to use for photolithography that will dictate that what is the minimum resolution you can go ahead okay so this is one formula for this resolution uh, this is n is that numerical aper aperture lambda is this wavelength of this light and k1 is that uh, process parameter or this uh, material parameter that is used for this photolithography what is that uh, that chemical uh, we are going to talk about it after a uh, few slide okay so then comes this e beam lithography it has more uh, resolution okay uh, so names and other applications uh, mostly these days e beam lithography is also used uh, alongside with this photolithography and there are other non photolithographic techniques that also used these days in mems names and it also has very um, high resolutions okay so what is this non photolithographic techniques that we will also discuss in this lecture okay and lastly uh, we will show one method that uh, learning that you will be able to prepare one micro channel on your own it is a very simple technique so i'll show how to prepare these micro channels or uh, microfluidic device okay so uh, this is that uh, lithographic methods and this corresponding resolution i have shown here you see that here within bracket this is uv light is used this is uh, year 1992 then as this year goes by people are uh, using smaller and smaller wavelength light okay so you can see that as this wavelength of this light is going down you can see this resolution is actually improving okay you can make finer structure i mean 100 nanometer structure uh, you can uh, prepare with this uh, photolithographic method okay so then uh, comes this advanced lithography that is extreme uv uh, lithography the, uh, there 13 nanometer uh, wavelength is used then soft x ray where 6 to 14 nanometers wavelength is used then focused ion beam and electron beam writing these are much more finer resolution will be given by this uh, methods okay so what is this photolithography here i have explained this uh, crudely suppose you have a silicon uh, silicon surface on which you prepare some uh, patterns micro nano patterns okay so what you will do you will uh, first on uh, suppose you are uh, growing some silicon oxide on top of it okay for some purpose or this is just a film on which you are going to work with okay it may be silicon oxide i mean you can make uh, you can do this oxidation of the silicon to grow some uh, thickness of this uh, layer 
silicon oxide or you can use some other film okay then you use that chemicals that i was talking about uh, two slides back that k1 in this uh, expression that k1 this k1 actually uh, depends on the type of this chemical what is used this is called resist it is basically called photoresist if it is photosensitive okay so this photosensitive uh, material is coated on this surface so this coating is done by spin coating generally uh, people can also do uh, deep coating also but generally spin coating is done to get this very thin uh, layer of this resist okay then what is done that mask is uh, placed on top of it okay and it is exposed with some light so this mask is blocking this light here here or here and it can pass through this open space okay uh, this light can pass through and it can re, uh, interact with this resist material that blue color resist material okay so when this light is interacting with this blue colored resist material what happens is that its chemical nature is changed okay yes. so it depends on what type of resist we are using it uh, it may get this uh, molecular structure it may get broken down into smaller piece, pieces or it may be uh, cross linked into a very a long polymer chain or something okay so if it is broken down into smaller polymer chain okay that means bond fusion is taking place then we call this positive tone resist okay and if it is cross linking occurs when it is interacting with this light then we call it a negative tone resist okay so what happens is if this molecule is getting smaller and smaller in case of positive tone resist we uh, wash it with is with a chemical which is called developer so we wash that material out so you see this uh, where there is interacting with this uh, light this dark region it is gone uh, when we are developing it if it is a positive tone resist but if it is a negative tone resist what happens is that this part is polymerizing okay and a separate developer we are using and that is taking away from this normal photoresist okay and this uh, cross linking hard uh, photoresist is remaining okay this is from this negative tone okay then subsequent uh, thing you can do you can just uh, do this etching of this material because now this uh, film is blocked by this uh, photoresist material with desired patterns so you can either etch out chemically or you can just uh, deposit something so that you can have some pattern like this that is shown here okay then finally this uh, lifting of of this uh, photoresist material is done using some other chemical okay this is broadly the general microfabrication technique generally used that photolithography we use really okay uh, electron uh, so once we have uh, known this what is that basic thing of photolithography that mask we are talking about here this mask uh, depending on the position of this mask we have different different uh, naming that contact painting we call if this mask is lying on the surface on the photoresist surface so this is that silicon wafer this is the photoresist layer and this is that mask okay and this is that light source this is the optical system to make it as a collimated uh, uh, ray so we have got this contact painting so this contact painting why it is contact painting because this mask is uh, lying on the top of this photoresist okay now uh, when it is exposing through this it is uh, either depending on this what type of photoresist it can just take out that material or it can cross link that material the benefit of this contact printing is that there is uh, you are getting very sharp edge okay and if this uh, photoresist is Uh, sensitive enough i mean if it is very soft so that you can not put this mask on top of it so there is a called uh, something called proximity printing 
which is that this uh, mask we are keeping it very near to this surface uh, this photoresist surface then we are doing the same thing okay and there is another called this projection printing here we can minimize this structure whatever this pattern structure is so here in case of contact printing and proximity printing we are getting this one is to one pattern formation okay but in case of projection printing what we do this whatever pattern is there we pass it through a lens so that this uh, pattern is basically miniaturized okay so we can get very small pattern uh, maybe 4x or 5x reduction of the size of this mask okay so we are getting very uh, small uh, scale pattern compared to this mask used okay so these are two examples uh, uh, we have shown using uh, prepared using this photolithographic technique okay so this is one uh, instrument uh, where this mask is prepared uh, this is called mask writer okay and this is another thing is called mask aligner where we use this same repeating pattern uh, so this is the mask or a reticle okay and this is the lens so light is shining this projection printing that i was talking about so it prints within this uh, area okay then you can just shift this wafer little bit so that it, it can uh, repeatedly pattern another uh, such pattern another such pattern like that you can cover this whole surface repeatedly okay so this is that use of this mask aligner okay so this is one example of this mask and uh, this is that using this mask this microstructure is prepared on a silicon wafer okay you, you see this uh, this pattern is replicated here on this silicon wafer okay so this is your general principle of this photolithography okay so here in this uh, lecture now i'm going to focus on non photolithographic uh, method for microfabrication that is called soft lithography mainly okay but apart from the soft lithography there are other uh, lithography technique like injection molding embossing some of these are also used in soft lithographic uh, method that i'll uh, talk about it later okay so there are various uh, different ways of uh, doing this photolithography okay so i'll uh, cover in this lecture few of them i have selected uh, few of this topic and uh, we'll cover that but you can see that this resolution is very high okay you can go up to 10 nanometer and so uh, here uh, using this replica molding or micro contact printing we have gone say 35 nanometer or 30 nanometer or so okay so you can see that non photolithographic method also giving you very high resolution printing or microfabrication okay so while we are talking about this microfabrication one material is very important i mean widely used in microfabrication that is polydimethyl siloxane i will talk about very uh, little chemistry about it because you are already uh, uh, learned uh, many chemistry about this deep eutectic solvent and all so here i will just cover uh, very little of this chemistry for this polydimethyl siloxane what happens is that uh, we get it uh, this is a commercial product that silgard 184 pdms kit okay it comes with two parts part a it contains this oligomer or dimethyl siloxane itself and part b it is a small quantity it delivers with this that is that basically this curing agent okay so this uh, curing agent is basically a catalyst which is made up of this palladium uh, nanoparticles okay uh, so what this part a that oligomer is called ba basically oligomer is nothing it is but uh, this combination of few monomers when it is connected with some bonds i mean very few monomers can associate together and can form oligomer okay and when we use this oligomer and mix this oligomer with this catalyst and if we heat it up or if we shine it with uv light uh, there are very various uh, types of uh, pdms kit are available one is uh, uv sensitive light sensitive or one is thermal curing okay so if we mix this oligomer with this uh, catalyst 
and uh, that means we are mixing part a and part b and we shine it with either uv light or we heat it up we get this cross-linked polymer okay so this cross-linked polymer it is very flexible okay and uh, it is very much inert that is the main advantage of this uh, pdms and uh, that is the main reason that we are using pdms for microfabrication for microfluidic device and all mostly we are using this PDMS and another thing is that it is transparent so that what is happening within this uh, microfluidic channel we can uh, see through then it is soft and flexible that I was talking about and it is mostly inner to this acid and alkali okay and another property is it is soluble to specific organic solvent why soluble is uh, specific property I mean uh, we we desired property because after microfabrication we need something out of this material that i will talk later so uh, if we swell that uh, material this pdms then it is easier to take out okay uh, some uh, molding wire or thread we are using i'll talk about it later okay and then this is that uh, mostly non-toxic and biocompatible so it is easier to use this PDMS and people are using this PDMS a lot for this microfluidic device fabrication. Okay. So here we are going to uh, talk about another uh, uh, lithographic techniques basically. Uh, so here what we are doing, we are using this electric field to create some uh, microstructure on this PDMS. Okay, so what we do, we use some uh, liquid crystal 5CV on this PDMS and uh, we apply this electric field uh, across this P uh, PDMS and this uh, 5CV layer. We get a nice structure, microstructure. Okay, so this is this sort of structure we get it uh, using this uh, electric field induced lithography. Okay, and if we drive this uh, 5CB liquid on top of it while this electric field is on, we get a aligned structure, what we call it uh, ECLL or, or electrodynamic contact line lithography. Okay, so these are this uh, micro OLs we generated. Okay, and this can be used as a micro pot. Okay, so that we can use very tiny little amount of this uh, reactant or uh, sensing material uh, to uh, to sense or uh, uh, do some uh, reaction very small amount of uh, reactant and uh, we can get very small amount of products to identify something okay so uh, here one video i have so this this sort of patterns we are getting from this electrodynamic contact line lithography so here we have a video see this uh, 5cb we are talking about that liquid crystal these are flowing over this flat PDMS and we are, I don't know whether you are able to see that these small structures are aligned in this direction. Okay, so this sort of uh, microstructures we can get from this ECLL. Once these microstructures uh, are fabricated, we can use it as a sensor. So here we have shown that one solvent sensor in presence of solvent, this lights, you can see it is going to, uh, off and again it is coming, uh, I mean evident when this uh, solvent vapor is removed. Okay, so this can be used as a chemical vapor sensor. Okay. Uh, now we are going to talk about something about this self assembly of uh, material, I mean molecules, because it will help you to drive this microfluidics uh, i mean this micro droplets on a surface okay so this will give a, a driving force basically so what is the self assembly self assembly is nothing but to proceed toward one state where this global energy of the system is minimum okay to so give a thermodynamic equilibrium state it will reach where this global energy is minimum okay so how it is prepared say we have a silicon wafer uh, and uh, we are uh, generally silicon wafer is hydrophilic okay that means it loves uh, water okay if you put a drop of water it will spread on this silicon wafer so what we do generally that 
uh, we first activate this surface of this uh, silicon wafer, which is SiO Si bond generally, and we activate it with this in presence of oxygen so that it forms SiOH bond. Okay, hydroxyl uh, group is formed. Okay, and we use some uh, trichlorosilane. This silane molecules it reacts with this uh, hydroxyl group, and HCl it is get removed, and this long chain hydrocarbon is uh, remain. Uh, I mean bonded on the surface, silicon surface. So from hydrophilic to hydrophobic surface, we are going to get because hydrophobicity is coming from this long chain hydrocarbon on the with, uh, associated with this trichlorosilane. Okay. So now there are uh, various different variation of that. Suppose we are uh, going to treat this surface. This this is one activated silicon wafer activated by this UV and this oxygen, and then we are putting some uh, trichlorosilane uh, drop here, and it is diffusing through this air. So what will happen? The area that is close to this uh, droplet, it will get more molecules and area which is far apart from this droplet it will get less number of area less number of this molecule attached so what you will get it will be this side where there are more number of molecules that will be less hydrophilic or more hydrophobic and this side will be more hydrophilic or less hydrophobic Okay, that means if I put some water, water will try to be this side rather than this side. Okay, <clears throat> so using this sort of surface, you can drive this uh, micro droplet in one direction. You see that there is a, a inchworm kind of movement you will see. So this surface is a, just a glass surface and this bottom surface, it is treated like this. This bottom surface is like this. Okay, so the moment you are putting some uh, liquid droplet uh, here, it is trying to move to this more hydrophilic region. So as you are squeezing it, it will try to move in this hydrophilic region. Okay, yeah. so you can drive this uh, micro droplet. Now using this, you can uh, formulate some micro reactor. Maybe you can have say this is uh, two three different reagent is there, okay, and you are mixing one after another. You see, first one this is mixed, then this one, then this will go and this will mix with this react uh, this droplet. So you can form a micro reactor out of it. Okay. So now let's talk about this some uh, micro molding fabrication. How to do that? So for that. It is basically a micro contact printing. Uh, micro molding, it is not really micro molding. Micro molding, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but using this micro molding, we can prepare this PDMS stamp. Okay, what what is that? We have this uh, some pattern on a, a surface and we pour this PDMS and this cross linker that we have talked about and we can just peel out this surface uh, spill out this uh, PDMS because it is soft and uh, you can take it out and this pattern is replicated here. Okay, and then you can use it as a contact printing. Uh, suppose you have some ink on a surface, you just tap it on this, I mean this uh, stamp, you can just, uh, flex. this is flexible PDMS stamp, you can just tap it on this uh, ink and then you can print it on some surface so this is that ink molecule okay that is going to attach on this surface okay so this way you can uh, get something uh, modified version of that you can make it as a roller and you can just drive the rollers and this molecules will print one after another like that okay so that is one uh, sort of micro uh, fabrication and here we are talking about this replica molding, which we shortly uh, presented as uh, REM. So what it is does uh, uh, that we have this PDMS stamp, as we have said in the uh, last slide, that how to prepare this PDMS stamp. So this on this PDMS uh, stamp, we can 
mold other pre-polymer. We can just pour it and then we cure it and we just peel it off. So this is called replica molding. What happens is that whatever this pattern we have on this PDMS, this uh, pattern we are got basically from this uh, PDMS pattern. It is just a negative replica of this PDMS. Okay, where there was protrusion. Now it is that other side there is protrusion and where there is protrusion uh, in this main PDMS. Uh, now there is a groove kind of uh, channel you are going to get. Okay. Now, uh, there is another technique that is called microtransfer uh, molding. What it does, you just uh, do the same thing. This pre-polymer, you pour it on this PDMS stamp. You remove the excess material, excess pre-polymer, and then you just place it on the surface and then cure it and you can take it out. But the uh, problem is that there is thin residual material still remain in this process. Okay. And there is uh, another technique which is called micro molding in capillarity, capillary, uh, what we call it mimic. Uh, what it does, this PDMS uh, stamp you have got, it is a groove kind of thing. So you can get a channel basically. When you place it upside down, you are going to get a micro, <coughs> micro channel uh, here. Okay, you can bond this also. Uh, if you want it permanently. If not, you just place it on uh, this uh, su support. You are going to get this temporary micro channel. Now, if you place some uh, pre polymer or some ink material, due to capillary action, this ink will be drawn through this micro channel and you are left with this pre polymer uh, or this ink. You just cure it and remove this uh, PDMS stamp. Okay. So now this uh, main part that is that uh, template assisted this microfabrication. This is important because using this technique, this is a very simple technique and using this you can prepare your own micro channel. What we do is basically uh, initially we take a very thin film of PDMS. Okay, it is cured PDMS you can take. Then you place a micro oil or micro thread whatever dimension of micro channel you need, uh, you just use that dimension wire or that, that dimension thread on top of it, place it, and then you pour again this uh, PDMS, that is uh, two part of this PDMS, basically silicon, that is cross linker and this oligomer. You mix it together and you pour it on top of it, and then you cure it at 120 degrees centigrade for say six hours or, or you can leave it for overnight also. <clears throat> then what you do, as, as I have told you that PDMS is soluble in some organic solvent. So once a solvent is chloroform, you just soil that. Now both this uh, PDMS is hardened. So you just soil it into this chloroform solution. You just dip it into this chloroform. So it will get soiled. Okay. And then you can remove this as it is soiled. It can be uh, easily removable. This uh, wire can be easily removable because it is soiled. So this pore size is a little bit enlarged. Okay. So you just remove this thread or wire, whatever you have used, and you are left with a micro channel. Okay. So after drying, this uh, chloroform is uh, removed. Then it is again come back to its original shape of this PDMS, and you will get one micro channel inside. So using this technique, you can. Uh, prepare your uh, uh, microfluidic device. Okay, so this is one example of this sort of. Uh, you see, this uh, two uh, lane uh, is coming together, so you can use two different uh, phase, two different uh, liquids. You can uh, put this into into this micro channel, and there is this serpentine uh, micro channel where this reaction or extraction. Uh, can happen. So in one uh, channel, you can use this uh, deep eutectic solvent. At that channel, you can use contaminated water and you can just uh, extract this material and you can s detect that what type of contaminant was there or something like that. You can do this sort of experiment here. Okay. So here I am showing one example uh, where instead of this why are they are using this ABS, that is acrylonitrile uh, butadiene styrene. 
this abs has a special property that it is uh, e easily uh, dissolved into this acetone okay acetone is uh, easily available solvent so you can use this acetone okay and this abs is also used generally in 3d printer so it it is very common you can get it uh, wherever this 3d printer is there so you can prepare some shape out of this abs and you can use it for uh, microfluidic device application see this example so this is one abs wire you can see this blue colored one Okay, and it is a uh, like a spiral kind of uh, shape. So you you take one petri dish and you just hang this uh, ABS wire and you pour this PDMS and this cross linker together. Okay, then you cure it at high temperature and you take this out. So this is a PDMS uh, with this ABS wire entrapped. Now you use acetone and this blue color ABS where that will be gone. Okay, then you just clean it with some more acetone. You can just inject some more acetone and you can clean it and you can get this micro channel within this uh, PDMS. Okay, so this is very simple. Okay, so you see this uh, red color solution, it is going through this micro channel. Okay, and it is very flexible. Okay. So you can embed some uh, heating arrangement within this uh, microfluidic device also so that you can heat at a particular position and you can do some reaction in this uh, microfluidic device. So this is uh, one example and uh, here I am showing another example. You can enjoy that. There are two colored fluid basically representing uh, two types of uh, liquid and here you can digitize this uh, fluids these are controlled using this uh, pneumatic valve okay so you see uh, two colored fluid they have used and they can arrange it in a microfluidic channel wherever they want okay and they can mix this uh, two colored fluid also you see here they're going to mix it mix it again mix it okay so you can do lots of things with this uh, microfluidic device so here is the summary of this uh, soft lithographic technique that i have discussed so this is that resolution you can go using these techniques like uh, mimic or micro tm you can go up to this uh, 10 uh, 100 micrometer to this one micrometer and then using samim or uh, rem you can again go further below it is 100 nanometer this is 10 nanometer or so and here are these corresponding applications i have shown here that MEMS sensors, it can be operating in this resolution. Okay, and nanoelectronic device, of course, work on this from 100 nanometers to 10 nanometers, mostly in that regime. So it is uh, uh, generally this REM is using uh, for this fabrication of this sort of device. Okay, <clears throat> so these are this uh, reference and I acknowledge uh, our chemical engineering department and Spark uh, and ACIB for doing uh, some of these works and uh, not uh, uh, and, and uh, mostly uh, uh, I acknowledge my students uh, who has worked hard to uh, do this sort of nice work. So thank you uh, all. Uh, so if you have any questions, I can take it. Yeah, but any questions? any questions? I, I let me uh, let me check the YouTube. I uh, know there are no okay. questions on YouTube as well. So okay. now, uh, like to thank Professor Partho Patidar because he had covered a lot of this. Uh, micro fabrication techniques, lithographical techniques. Hopefully, we will be. We have still not used in iterative solver, but we are trying and planning this experiment. 
So I'll again like to thank Parthu for this wonderful insight on this. Thank you uh, for inviting me. Yeah. Thank you. Now we go to the next lecture. The next lecture uh, it is uh, as per our is the the extraction of bioactive compounds. Okay. So this will be delivered by Professor Bernardo Diaz Ribeiro from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So the Ribeiro graduated at chemical engineering from in the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in 2005 and obtained master's and doctorate degrees at chemical and biochemical engineering from the same institute in 2008 and 12 respectively. Nowadays, he is a professor at biochemical engineering department at UFRG and since 2018, he is also a visiting researcher at the University de Lisboa, Portugal. He has experience in clean technologies, focuses on enzymatic processes, natural products valorization and neutrotic solvents such as ionic liquids and depredatic solids. Now, the, because of some preoccupation and some uh, urgent issues, so he could not deliver in person. Uh, so he will be delivering it through recorded lecture. So I will ask my assistant, assistant to kindly play that uh, lecture. Yes, Papu, can you please play the lecture? Yes, so we will be playing his lecture. Hi, I'm Professor Bernardo Dias. Just two minutes. School of Chemistry at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And today I'm going to speak of extraction of bio bioactive compounds using ionic liquids and eutectic solvents. First of all, we have to talk about bioactives. Uh, so, what's the meaning of this term? This term is related to phytochemicals and sometimes about the uh, metabolites produced by microorganisms. So, these phytochemicals we can be extracted from foods or food byproducts and able to regulate metabolic func functions leading to beneficial effects. So, uh, What's the kind of bioactivity we're talking about? So, what's the bioactivity we're talking about? We're talking about every possible way to uh, prove this compound has some biological activity. Uh, the more common are uh, antioxidants, uh, antimicrobial, analgesic, anti-inflammatory, uh, many tests about cytotoxicity. And so, uh, everything related to pharmacological, nutraceutical, or cosmeceutical applications. One example about this active compound is the group of polyphenols. Uh, here is a uh, anthocyanine. Uh, this case is, is a good case because with different pH, we have different colors. So in neutral to alkaline, we have a kind of blue, uh, a quinonoidal base, blue to green. And with ACE pH, we have uh, a pink, violet, more red, uh, uh, a color. We have here uh, oxonium, pavilion, uh, ketium. Uh, here is an example of hydrangea. It's a plant, common plant in high altitudes in, in Brazil. Little cold ones. 
Na hora do exemplo, eles ficaram tendo whites. Uh, have aqui Beta Carotene e Astaxantin. Uh, beta Carotene is present in carrots and some kind of uh, yeasts. Here the Odontorola glutinid yeast. Uh, in Astaxantin, in the salmon, it's kind of orange, uh, pink, orange and pink color. So it's, it's carotenoid is characterized by uh, many colors, uh, yellow, orange, red, uh, and many kinds of uh, uh, foods. Another example are the terpenes. Here, the first of uh, limonene is a kind of monoterpene. It's a major component about orange essential oil. Uh, here are two examples of uh, sesc terpenes from ginger. Uh, in here, the example of d terpene is the phytoquinone uh, beta, uh, vitamin uh, K1, uh, present in, in many green, green vegetables. There is a, another example, it's the class of triterpenes. Here we have a, a oleanolic acid as an example. It's from very present in the olives, olive oil, and saponins, that's a type of triterpene that is glycosylated. Uh, we have different types of saponins, we have steroidal ones. But this is from Pertipin. And another example is Ginsenoside from Ginseng. Another type of BIRT is very representative ones is the class of alkaloids. Uh, we have many type of types of alkaloids. I, I just picked the uh, more known ones. Uh, here the piperine from black pepper uh, I use in foods. We have the uh, pilocarpine from pilocarpus jaborandi and caffeine from coffee and tea and many other types of foods. Uh, and pilocarpine is, is uh, used in of tonic uh, as eye drops uh, against glaucoma. We talked about bioactives, so we have to talk about extraction. So, first type of extraction, solid liquid. We have the link with coffee to, to as example that you have uh, a solid mass matrix, uh, plant matrix, vegetable matrix, and some kind of solvent here to uh, extract, to leach uh, the compounds of more uh, correlated, more interaction with the solvent. So we have here the solvent being transferred to the matrix the solubilization of the uh, fraction uh, that have some uh, connection, interaction with the solvent, and then the solvent but plus the fraction being to do bulk. So the idea is very simple, but what uh, have big influence in the in the extraction? The method of the extraction have influence in the yield of extraction. But uh, I'm talking about method. Method is Soxlet, uh, it's steering or not steering, or using ultrasound, using microwave, um, some examples of that. Temperature. If you can rise the temperature, you're going to increase the yield of extraction, no? 
yeah, but you have to pay attention about uh, it's not infinite. You have to pay attention about the composition, degradation of the uh, soluble fraction, the bioactives, the, also the matrix, uh, the plant matrix, uh, the solvent. So you don't, you have a limit of the increase of the temperature. You have to know uh, this in the literature, in literature. You can find this data. Uh, but you can measure this in lab using a TGA, a thermographic uh, analysis. Another factor here is steering. Uh, more steering, a more uh, yield of suction. Uh, time. Time is uh, a very tricky thing in this direction because many times you, you want a, a kind of fact. Uh, many, many plant metrics have uh, tons of bioactives. So sometimes you extract first uh, a kind, a group of bioactives and with time you, have, you extract more of others bioactives. So, uh, Example of that is the the coffee. You, if you going to extract make coffee, uh, uh, slow uh, time, slow period of time making coffee, you uh, generate a coffee with a stranger uh, taste, don't you? You have to extract more things that you <laughs> that you need. Uh, contact area. Uh, another good thing to think. Many articles uh, don't give this information about granulometry, uh, the Pascal diameter of the plant uh, matrix. Uh, so it's difficult to compare some kind of papers. With this, with, without this data, and also the mass ratio solvent matrix is all, all uh, articles have, but uh, in, in important information. And the information about solvent, the physical chemical property of solvent, uh, and then you have here a, a direct relation with Eutetic liquid, eutetic solvent, and ion, ionic liquid. We have two more here when we think about them. It's the quantity of water or another solvent uh, besides the ionic liquid and eutetic solvents. And in specific in case of gas, uh, we have to think about molar ratio. The proportion, the, uh, the ratio about the two component, the two compounds of the optetic is it can uh, have a big influence. And in many cases, in many articles, we have only one uh, molar ratio chosen and working the working in all article. And maybe if you have some variation in moral ratio, you have different results in this fraction. Well, uh, another type is the liquid liquid extraction. And we have two different liquids that don't, they are immiscible. Uh, we have some mixing about them then we settling to separate phases, and then we have two different phases, the extract phase, and a phase that you have added, and where your solute, your bioactive goes, and went, and a half phase, when, <laughs> what that 
a ways that you can recycle to another uh, extraction. Uh, here we talk more about uh, partition coefficient or distribution coefficient. Uh, we have kind of uh, similar uh, parameters here that, in, that have a big influence in, the, in this partition coefficient. Uh, one, one type different here is the contact area. We have two different uh, solvents, so, so a, a volume ratio or a mass ratio between them. It's the the thing we have to think. Uh, as the other things is the is the same. We have the, the the same idea. Examples of this liquid liquid extraction is using ionic liquid and aptic solvents with miscible molecular solvents, uh, aqueous salt solution, aqueous polymer solu solution, and uh, if you're using something with water, né? aqueous salt solution or polymer solution, uh, another uh, parameter you have to measure you think about is pH. Uh, in, in solid liquid extraction, also you have if you have some uh, quantity of water. So here we have some um, work in the literature. Uh, just informing us uh, the use of ionic liquids in solid liquid extraction. So yeah, here this figure table uh, informing about small organic extractable compounds, so alkanoids, terpenoids, phenolics, and alkaloids, and no no surprise to no one, you have a big quantity of works using imidazole in ionic liquids. Uh, majorly the using chloride and bromide anions. Uh, okay, we have some work with uh, polyne, but no, so, not, not so much. We have here uh, these small circles is about uh, 0 to 5. I think it's 1 to 5, but it's okay. Uh, works in this, using this cation. Uh, you have here the imidazole, it's the more than uh, 30 to 40 works. So you have these these concentrations, but you have so many types here of uh, anions and cations uh, using in, in this subject. So another example in the same article from Ventura, 2017, uh, solid liquid extraction with ionic liquids. Yes, with different compounds, uh, fat acid, methyl esters, carotenoid, saponin, essential oils, and vitamins. And here, just to uh, have to be a little more empathic, because saponin is not exactly a uh, hydrophobic one, it's an amphotelic one. And vitamins, we have hydrophilic vitamins, we have hydrophobic vitamins. And, and in this article, you have all the same thing together. But we still have imidazole and cation a big shot in the extraction, solid sleep extraction. Uh, it's the more old, more known, so it, it's, it's okay to have more works in this subject using this ionic liquid, 
uh, you, you still have the chloride anion and bromide anion with uh, a great percentage of influence in this works, but we have a, a increase here in another anions like uh, the fluoride ones, né? PF4, uh, PF6, and TF2. We have an increase in the carboxylated ones, uh, acetate, propionate, butyrate, uh, sulfate too, uh, and choline. We have an increase of the works using choline cation, but it is still uh, few. Uh, So you have here uh, some examples using authentic solvents. We don't have some uh, deep reviews in, in this area uh, explaining more about the use of authentic solvents in the, in the biotip extraction, in the type of what kind of authentic solvents better. Uh, but we have uh, some ideas. Uh, much of the work with filtratic solvents in this activity extraction is, is foc focusing in the uh, polyphenols. So maybe because uh, more interaction using uh, anions, anions, no, with uh, hydrogen bonding donors. Uh, type of acids, organic acids, or with uh, uh, high quantity of uh, possibilities of hydrogen bonding, like glycerol, or another ones with many types of uh, hydroxyl groups. So, have a big kind of direction of polyphenols that have also a high number of Hydrocyl groups. So here we have some examples of uh, eutetic solvent in extraction of uh, phenolics. Uh, so we have here pigeon pea in Cajan Cajan, and the leaves of pigeon pea using uh, uh, choline chloride with maltose, that's a sugar type. Using microwave, we have some conditions here. Uh, fix it uh, six degrees, 12 minutes. That's a fast one. Uh, you have water in it at 20% of water, it's a high quantity of water, uh, and a liquid solvent ratio of 30 to 1. And you have a double in the extraction. When you use comparing with citric acid glucose. In the case of safflower, uh, Cartamus tinctorius, using a kind of similar uh, eutetic uh, chloride sucrose, but with no microwave, and then you go to 12 for one hour, but it's still a high quantity of water. And you have a big increase in the extraction of this kind of phenolics here. As we go to 30 to uh, 2,680. So we don't have the unit here, but I think maybe it's the milligram by liter. And another one is the uh, Japanese cypress or Hainoki. Is the Shama Cyparis Optus. Using another type of eutetic is a phosphonium one, methyltryphenyl phosphonium bromide with itanin glycol, uh, one by five, and 50% of methanol. Uh, oh, but 
it's so many water is so many metal you you still ha are uh, that solvent so I think maybe you have this dis discussion in another lecture but I can assure you that we also had doubt of this well in this case uh, we have an increase in the uh, phenolic extraction but uh, not so big uh, increase I I worked with this team too in this article using ionic liquids and aesthetic solvents to extract saponins from uh, Joa, which is if Joazeiro, uh, Joa Bark, and uh, uh, Agava Cisalana, meaning the sisal, the waste of sisal. Uh, when sisal is used in Brazil uh, to make ropes, uh, because the long fibers, uh, but from all these leaves, uh, more than 90 percent is waste. Only ten percent, uh, five to ten percent, going to be a hope. So, you have a big quantity of waste. And it is a mucilaginous waste, rich, and, and steroidal saponins. So, in this work, we test many kinds of uh, ionic liquids, only using choline ones. Uh, uh, mixing with water, mixing with uh, ethanol and water, uh, using a 24 hours extraction, you have some kind of increase and in, uh, selectivity from uh, phenolic compounds that may exist uh, in in these vegetable matrix and. In, both in Joa and Cisal. And, and this work I included the cost because uh, this is not uh, cheap in Brazil. And to make uh, economically viable, we had to include that. So we had to thinking these two types of things. So we have here many types. We have using uh, organic acids, many organic acids to, to, to prepare these ionic liquids. So uh, acetate, polyne acetate, polyne propinate, butyrate, hexanoate, succinate, lactate, uh, citrate, oxalate, malonate, Benzoate, salicylate, and phenylacetate. Uh, we have different results here. We, we don't have the same saponin, types of saponin. We have saponins with different uh, types of glycosylation. Joa have sulfate groups in these uh, saponins. So we have different results here. Uh, we are using ethanol and water, so the the adding a different cost solvent, we have different values to uh, have a, a little increase in this in this extraction, and eutetic solvents uh, using water. It's a little inferior to to ionic liquids and a little better using what ethanol and water. So here's just to to show some examples that 
uh, I worked. Another work using here uh, solid to liquid and liquid to liquid extraction, but here I'm going to focus on liquid to liquid extraction. Is the is this work is about uh, extraction saponins and polyphenols from match. It's a kind of plant that in Brazil and Latin America uh, we make a beverage, a good beverage in in the beaches. In Brazil, we have uh, majorly in Rio. We have people sending, uh, sailing, uh, matching, back, matching beverage in, in beaches. And tea, yeah, many kinds of tea, but here we try to work with uh, green tea and green mati. Green mati is, is the source of some beverages in the south, uh, south of Brazil, named the Chimarrão, a very bitter <laughs> a beverage. So here we try to extract uh, using ionic liquids uh, this compound, saponins and polyphenols, and then uh, recovering them. How? Uh, after the solid silica extraction, I remove the biomass and add in the liquid phase uh, a aqueous solution of uh, Cray 3 uh, phosphate, potassium phosphate. And you have the biphasic system. Uh, we have a phase rich and saponins and polyphenols uh, is still more saponins than polyphenols uh, but it's still with ionic liquids and then uh, the, this system is ionic liquid here is 30 percent uh, colline chloride in water so it's more water than colline chloride but so it's still there and then I added a hydrophobic ionic liquid, the polynium NTF2. And then a magic occurred. The uh, saponins and polyphenols going to upper phase with water. And colline chloride and colline NTF2 going to down phase, to bottom phase. And we have really a separation. Okay, it's, uh, it's expensive separation, but we have. The result about that is here. Uh, you can see the K here is the uh, partition coefficient. Uh, so you have a, a great uh, partition in the upper phase that is almost water and in both uh, materials, né? tea and mate. And, and then with the saponins from mate, we have a big, né? very high uh, result in the partition coefficient and, and some kind of uh, selectivity too. And the alpha here uh, is the Concentration factor, concentration uh, coefficient, and just measure how much the concentration, the top phase, in relation to the concentration of the feed phase, the feed uh, stream, and then the initial stream. So you have uh, uh, some kind of recovery here. Né? And you can use the liquid liquid extraction. And I can, in this option, use the uh, eutectic, sol 
é, de hidrofílico, que é o Taft Sovens, e a hidrofóbica que é molecular solvents here, mas é de waste, é só a bean oil deodorizer distillate, é a uh, rich and tocopro ou vitamin A. So here we you can see the uh, the variation of the ratio of the ethylic solvent to the soybean deodorated distillate. And the the better the better diprotetic solvent tested was the choline chloride uh, paracresol. Uh, he uh, Liu and his group uh, test others uh, 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 ethylic solvents and uh, only work it with the HBD uh, with aromatic group. So to to make the in this interaction with tocopherol, so he tested they tested uh, para meta orto uh, cresol he all worked and you can see that with a proportion of six six uh, ml of eutetic uh, milliliters of eutetic solvents to one gram of these waves uh, can be a uh, uh, maximum yield of tocopherol it's an option another option it's the, the reverse using a uh, eutetic hydrophobic eutetic solvent and uh, a weaker solution of organic acids here he makes in the uh, an extraction column field of uh, glass beads small glass beads two milliliters and then analyze the two uh, phases but in this case uh, comparing just with terpene, uh, liquid terpene, and uh, the terpene and the eutetic solid or popic eutetic solvent have very similar results. So, a more uh, cheap to use the only the terpene here, but he can make all all both of them can. Uh, have a good yield in the extraction of this uh, fatty acid. This, this organic acid is it's not exactly volatile fat. Né? Fat for me is uh, above CH. Uh, uh, below CH is just organic acid. Uh, you can use the AQ2 phases here in the liquid extraction. Some examples using uh, choline chloride, butanediol with phosphate salt, or here with uh, also another way to describe choline chloride. Uh, I think. Uh, with carboxylic acids and polypropylene glycol uh, or uh, with propanol in phosphate and, and so on the very options here to extract uh, metabolites uh, using HPS uh, other example with use of the eutetic solvents extracting bacteria from plants it's this work it's my recent work that used the a combination of uh, eutetic solvents hydrophobic hydrophobic eutetic solvents uh, with enzymes to extract uh, some types of carotenoids like lutein zeaxanthin and uh, phenolic compounds, né? basically uh, phenolic acids from sunflower wastes, uh, 
sunflower waste here is the uh, uh, petals, né? <laughs> sunflower petals, kind of the florets, the, the uh, core of the flower that is uh, not used or used as ornament, ornamental way. So in this work, we use uh, two types of extraction, no enzymes and with enzymes. So this enzyme is the uh, combination, a commercial, commercial combination of uh, cellulases and M cellulases that are enzymes I, I'm going to explain in another lecture, but uh, enzymes are catalytic proteins and these specific ones uh, break down cellulose and M cellulose. M cellulose is like uh, a chilene uh, that's a polysaccharide rich and xylose. So it's the uh, structural matrix, matrix of the plant, in this case of the petal, né? petal flower. So we have here né, all of these conditions fixed, uh, proportion a uh, ratio of 1 to 10 or liquid to, to solid to liquid. Uh, upper, uh, so liquid here is the water plus the solvent. The proportion in, in relation solvent in water is one to one. Um, uh, concentration of the enzymes, 0.25% uh, uh, of the liquid volume and uh, 2000 uh, RPM, 2 hours, and 40 degrees Celsius. And then we have here uh, different results. Uh, when we prepare this work, we expect that um, the authentic with menthol and lauric acid, that is the dodecanoic acid, uh, you're going to present the, the best results, but no, uh, we see uh, the mixture of menthol and lactic as the better results. So it's going to be very strange in this time because I think it's not hydrophobic enough. But maybe here we have a combination that uh, hydrophobic solvent that is not so hydrophobic. And uh, acetic let, uh, lactic acid uh, leaching to water phase maybe helped uh, to hydrolyze the, the polysaccharides with the enzymes. Um, so it's a combination of these things. And these types of uh, carotenoids in this sunflower is not so hydrophobic. In utilization, it have functional groups that make them less hydrophobic than uh, beta carotene. So, uh, was a good result, but not the, the think that this was going to be the good result. And when we think about polyphenols, we have many results similar. Uh, we, we still see the uh, mental and mental aesthetics have good results, but not so different between them than we expect. And the, the use of the enzymes have no much difference in this in this case uh, than if we see to, to carotenoids. Well, until now we talked about extraction, but if there is extraction, we have to, to 
to have recovery. We have to remove uh, the bacteria from the solvent. And sometimes we're using ionic liquids and aesthetic solvents, and, and this is not so easy. But we have some options. One kind of option here is back section. Just you have uh, uh, after the all phase, uh, liquid phase obtained, you use another solvent. Maybe just water is good, or maybe so uh, aqueous solutions of dilute acid or base can make the, some difference. Here, in this example, you have hydrophobic ionic liquids, aqueous solution with pH uh, less than P pKa. Uh, then we have ionic liquids plus amino acid. Then we have another aqueous solution with the pH uh, higher than pKa and then the amino acid Go, go to aqueous solution and ionic liquid phase can be recycled again. Distillation, we have two types of distillation. In here, we have we can think about uh, distillation of ionic liquid. We have biomass, a protic ionic liquid. Um, extraction of tannins, and then we distillate the ionic liquid. And then you can use an antisolvent here to precipitate and, and selectively separate the types of tannins. Uh, tannins is the type of uh, polyphenols, polymers. <laughs> Uh, 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 polycatechins or polyphenolic acids is, is, have some types. But to make it easy, uh, you can think about uh, polymers of polyphenols. Another uh, line of thinking here is uh, removing the active. So you use the ionic liquid, uh, extract the bioactive, and then you uh, distillate the active. And then here you use solvents to remove the polymers, probably uh, polysaccharides, uh, maybe kind of lignin, and recycle the ionic liquid. Uh, I worked in this type of way, but instead of recovering using these uh, methods, I tried membrane separation. So I try here different types of tea and matis, so green tea, black tea, white tea, green mati and black mati uh, with different attack solvents and uh, comparing with water and ethanol uh, 30% in water using that with comparison all that with 100% of extraction uh, just to make it easy to compare uh, and then we extract everything, the solid liquid extraction. And then we go into membranes. So we have this liquid phase, remove the solid result with centrifugation plus water because the polysaccharide really dissolved. And we, we're going to talk about that in another lecture. It's really dissolved, and water precipitate them, centrifugate, and remove the polysaccharides. 
a simple filtration, then a microfiltration, just to remove more particulate, uh, and then tests the ultrafiltration and nanofiltration with cutoff of 50 and 10 kilodaltons. And in the nanofiltration, we can talk about cutoff uh, of uh, 1 kilodalton and uh, 500 uh, daltons. Uh, I, I put here a reminder that in, in this work, uh, the material retained in membranes will remain in contact with ethanol to dissolve fouling and be analyzed as well. Uh, it's because, it's because we, the retentate here is not exactly a, a, a retentate, it's not liquid, it's just everything uh, that have been fouling the membrane. So, to analyze that, we put the membrane in alcohol, ethanol, uh, to dissolve every particulate, every polyphenol there, and then uh, analyze it. We put on the uh, fixed volume, 20, 20 milliliters, and then analyzed. So, we see that uh, analyze after a uh, microfiltration to have a comparison and just here with concentrations values and then we see okay, that in, in saponins with permeate the little a little decrease but uh, just a little and phenolic compounds, no. Phenolic compounds, you really have a decrease. So you have some kind of has some kind of uh, selectivity from saponins or, or for by phenolic compounds. They really removed, but not enough. Um, you need more data from. Uh, non-filtration with uh, cutoffs with low value, uh, 300 uh, daltons, uh, 100 daltons, to to be only saponins, no phenolic compounds in the permeate. But it's working, not exactly the way uh, I want all supplements, all phenolic streams, but it's working. Here the example, the, some photos about uh, how uh, the membranes, the state of membranes, black tea is the more uh, dark one, so they chose, uh, have big quantity of material of 10 kilodaltons and just small ones and uh, another, uh, another molar mass. Uh, sadly, uh, aesthetic solvents not interact only with plants, uh, only polysaccharides, they interact with polymers. So we have a problem here. Uh, this polymer, the uh, severe uh, eroded, and with all this procedure, but the 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 company we talked up with the company uh, explained, and they give us another one, another o ring here. But if I have to, to give an uh, advice, if it's, it's, uh, we start off membrane or polymer, 
uh, before you test it, uh, ask the company a little piece of this material and analyze it. Analyzing the is the is the polymer swollen, the polymer degradating, because you can avoid some problems. Uh, yeah, and this work is going uh, have been been finished uh, in these days, or we trying to. Uh, and that's it. Uh, you can uh, look for me uh, in this email, Bernardo arroba uh, eq dot ufrj dot br. And you can see my website, uh, cleantech dot eq dot ufrj dot br and I can uh, surely I can uh, answer all your questions there thank you for your attention and see you in the next lecture Okay, so we come to an end. So the any queries you will be having, Hi, as mentioned. mentioned. Yeah. So, so any query you will be having to Professor Bernardo, kindly mail him. Uh, email is already given in the chat box. Is shared. So he will be very happy to respond to any queries. So with this, we come to the end of day three of the short term course. So we again start tomorrow where we have three lectures all by Bernardo. Then we will be taking up this bioactive compounds. We will be having three lectures, this processing of biomass, the enzyme catalysis and organocatalysis, and finally the interaction with environment. Then after that, maybe uh, at the end, we will have a feedback from all the participants. So I will request all of them to stay till the end, which will be an open forum for discussion. If you have any suggestion or anything you want to add or comment, then maybe we can close the short term course after that. Thank you again. I hope you are all doing well. We meet tomorrow. Good night.